Prima Media's Polity, Amlum Gilen Gonfe. Joining me today is Hanif Tayob, here to discuss his book titled Going According to Plan, The Architectural Journey of Aziz Tayob. Your book covers the life and career of the trailblazing architect Aziz Tayob. Can you tell us more about his background in Brits and the educational journey which led him to becoming a renowned architect? Okay, look, my dad was born in Polakwani, you know, it was Pit Petersburg in those days, and then as a young child, he moved back to Brits, where his, his parents were originally based. You know, it was just after World War One. The schools were all, you know, they were like three grades in one classroom or four, or something. the entire school was in one classroom, depending on the year. And then the school only went up to standard four, which is today's grade six. And then to, to further your education, you know, many many people it was in those days opted not to further, but if he wanted to further his education, he had to go to Pretoria. So that was his primary school education. I know he, he does talk about having an eyesight problem, which nobody knew about. So his early grades were, where you know, the teacher said he doesn't, he can't even read, you know, things like that. So it was only later they realized that his difficulty was actually eyesight. And in the book, we do cover where he talks about, you know, for the first time seeing, you know, differentiating between C and O, the word letter C and letter O, and then even seeing, you know, blade of grass for the first time. Uh, so, so a lot of things we take for granted, but that's what that's what that was his his beginning, his early let's put it early school schooling experience. Aziz Tayyab was the first non-white person to qualify as an architect from Brits University in 1969. Can you highlight the significance of this achievement and what this meant to him? Again, we we you know we take things for granted uh, with, with our you know newfound freedom, but in those days it was a it was a struggle. You you couldn't just do what you wanted to do. If you wanted to go to a university, you had to apply for a ministerial consent. Um, and then on top of it, you still had to apply for university acceptance. So it was that stage. So you had to write to a minister. And then each university, for example, would have maybe just one place for, you know, a black person or, or a person of Indian descent, a colored person of Chinese. So there's one place generally. It was a difficult situation. Obviously, it was like now post-1948. Obviously, you know, you can see the National Party had now come into power. And they were flexing with myself. I know my dad talks about, you know, very talented people. They either gave up, you know, with trying or some, you know, were lucky few managed to go overseas to, to, to study. In what ways did Aziz's architectural thesis set the precedent for the manner in which he decided to design the Roshni and Klagstop mosques and the Benoni Seva Samaj temple? So those buildings were not done by people who were from the same faith uh, in the past. So my, my dad was able to, when he did his thesis, you know, it was almost like you could say it was groundbreaking because he was now obviously someone from the faith. He studied the Quran, he studied other religious texts, and then he was able to you know, produce the mosque. Uh, and then he was obviously able to, you know, analyze what, what the requirement is, both from, from a spiritual point as well as from a practical point, uh, you know, the flow of the, of the building and its functions. And then that same thought process was then transferred when he, once he, graduated he could then you know apply now to the real building and when you look at those mosques you mentioned there were no mosques which were similar to that so he rethought so in the, the thesis here he, he analyzed it processed it and applied it and then the, those mosques are very different to what was there before but when you reflect on it they actually made a lot of sense for the community and the, the climate we were building for how did Aziz navigate the challenges of developing his architectural practice under the Group Areas Act? Also, how did he respond to the people who questioned his professional competence on the basis of his race? Uh, look, for starters, from the student days, you know, it was there. I mean, he talked about, like, you know, when you had to go as, as a student to go to visit the building manufacturing factories, he wasn't allowed to go. So that's an obstacle which we don't, which we don't think existed now. But he was fortunate he had like lecturers who made excuse. I mean, one lecture they said they made him the class captain. So they were enlightened lecturers, uh, fair. And it, then they, but then the excuse was the class can't go, the class captain. So then the, those manufacturers, uh, you know, I would say obviously racist, had to concede and allow him to go. So, you know, so there was that that journey. Um, in, in, I mean, in the book also, you'll see, I, I, I put some snippets of, of things from, you know, the, the with student magazine or newspaper. And, and you know, one is, all, you know, openly, glorifying apartheid, you know, why it's necessary, you know, for, almost from an academic point of view. Obviously, uh, so that's as, as a campus having, you know, a white university, but still having, you know, few uh, non-white students in it, in it but, and 
this is what you had to what you had to face. You know, uh, this open prejudice. Uh, so that's on the student side, and 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 once he graduated, he needed internship, and there the excuse was, no, you can't, we can't take you because we don't have a, a toilet for non-white. You know, so that became the one hurdle, and and I think my dad said, it doesn't matter. He, he, you know, he, 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 that's not an issue. You'll make a plan. Um, and then you know it became okay. Now in architect, who do you register with? You know what what institute you register? Are you, the institute suddenly is now is unsure what to do because suddenly now there's a non-white person. Can he join? Is he allowed to join? Does the law allow him to join? Uh, you know, so there was that questioning. So th- even small things like that, and obviously you have to register to practice. So so that became something open. Uh, obviously there were other other fields which which had overcome that that obstacle. I think like we could say maybe. I think the legal, they probably had their own, like, you know, Black Lawyers Association or some sort of body, or doctors might have had their own, like, non, non-white non bodies already. But for architecture, it was the first one. And and we, it's not long. I mean, we're talking about 1970. And then the next one was, a, as he's working, you know, he's getting, he's, he's obviously, his skill is improving. And then he's got white people under him, which have to take instruction for, from him. Now, that, obviously, you understand the situation, the part is, that's now very odd, you know, for somebody... You know, when you talk of superiority, now how, how can how can this person how can I I work under non-white person? You know, that's the the mentality or the the thinking, and it becomes an issue. And and then even my dad talks of like even now suddenly when there's a pay a salary issue, like how how can this person earn more than me? You know, I I'm I'm white, and this is not what how can so things like that which which you take for granted. But I I managed to sort of piece those things into the book. Obviously, um, it's it's a very positive uh, book, you know. I, I think it, it it's about teaching lessons and that, but that uh, that does come into the book. Um, obviously, at the same time, my dad he gives credit credit to you. There were very many people he's got a lot of praise for, you know. Obviously, obviously I would say that pays white people, um, you know, whether it's lecturers or or students or, or employers, you know, who understood the the situation, but they were able to the, do their best to accommodate him. And then you ask the group areas. He talks about like he, you know, he, he to open an office or he went to hire premises, and and his thing was like he'll, he'll hide where the you know the engineers are, so in the same building. And then but he he had to use the goods lift because the the main lift was was reserved for 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 you know the, the white staff or white customers or clients. Um, and and he also talked of saying he he employed some you know staff which were were white. They could use the main lift, but he couldn't use it. You know, so things like that, which it's absurd. It's completely absurd, but that was the reality of, of that time. Um, and I, I think we can, we, I think something we can't understand. Um, I, I think there it, it would be a lot of pain, you know, if, if, my, if I, my dad's memories of that. You know, it's it's not a nice feeling. It's 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 humiliating. It's degrading. Um, you know, so so that's why the book does cover that 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 period in some way. Aziz Tayyab has conducted design work for a variety of public and private projects, including houses, mosques, shopping centers, hospitals, petrol stations, to name a few. What were some of the strategic considerations that went into the design work of these projects, and how important was it for him to understand the communities that he was designing for? I, I think that's the basics, you know, of, of architectural education. You, you you understand the the context, you know, the, the location, the client. So I think his thing was always about excellence. Your work must be your best work. You know, the client's paying you, and you are expected to perform, uh, you know, in that way. And and I and he always told you, you know, it was not um, you know cheap frills and things like that. Right? It was very like um, had to you know it had to be right. It had to be right. It had to work, and it had to last as well. You know, that was his his, his philosophy. Can you tell us more about Mr. Tayob's friendship with businessman Abi Mudise from Kharangua and his experiences with Papura Tswana leader Lucas Mangope in Tabaki? Okay. Yeah. So one of the clients he got was uh, Mr. Abi Mudise. Now Abi Mudise Abi Mudise is a business person who wished to frequent the, the business of my grandfather, his father. And then they, they struck friendship and you know Abi needed to, to develop something. He, he was a savvy business person. You know, also working in that apartheid climate and is able to, with all the difficulty, you know, make inroads. So a lot, I would say, like how Aziz was able to do. So, you know, find find ways around thing, around all, all the obstacles, not give up. And, you know, so I think they, they had a friendship. You know, Aziz helped him with his project. If you need loans, if you need, um, you know, to apply, for example, to the a filling station, you know, there was a certain process you had to follow. So Aziz was able to help AB with that. You know, so it was not just... Um, your architecture relations with it, it was it was a friendship but was also in you know, other 
other elements of business. And then you the, the, asked the Lucas Mugopi thing. Now they were building the homelands. So I, I, I think when he, he met Aziz, there was like an, an honesty, like an honest respect. So I think uh, Lucas Mugopi recognized it in Aziz, an ethical person he could deal with. And Lucas Mugopi was fair. I think he, he gave him decent sized project. I just could never get from you know anywhere else. And obviously he accepted it and then he, he delivered. You know, he, he was... He provided the service. He made sure the quality was right for the for the people who was building. It was it wasn't shoddy work. Um, you know, so I, you know, so I, I think there was a good uh, professional ethical and relationship. Um, yeah. In what ways did the dawn of democracy in 1994 signal a turning point in the architectural career of Aziz Tayyab? It opened the doors. You know, there was no more job restriction. The potential was much greater than before. And again, I think for a person who wants to do quality, who wants to you know give back, uh, you know, put, provide a good service, uh, you know, skills, uh, you know, that's the kind of you know, it, as he's obviously welcome that, um, you know, I could I could almost say it was it was there was like a relief um, in in that when when that happened, uh, and um, and a great enthusiasm, um, you know, that's the sense I get. Can you tell us about the process that went into writing this book? and why you deemed it relevant for the public to gain a better understanding of Aziz Tayyab. My dad always, you know, he said, I mean, he mentors students or give, you know, talks to clients or other architects or colleagues, and he's also got his stories of, of his experiences. So we said, okay, you know, we must put something together. And I think this is quite unique, uh, you know, for a, a book about an architect in South Africa. And this is sort of a life story. So often you get architecture books about the, the architecture. But in this case, it actually, it's it's the architecture, but it's the whole story behind the architect. I think also the other thing is, my dad's still practicing. So when we started putting the, the buildings together, you know, the works together, we were trying to make it easy to read. So it's not just an architecture textbook, but something which, which will explain something. And as we're analyzing, we're seeing, you could put the story of apartheid below it. So it's almost became a, a story of architecture of an architect and a story of the country in, in a way. And then if I explained, you know, the, the, the process of putting together, it's my, myself and my sister, we actually both work in the office. She's been here from 1985. I've been here from, you know, 1990, um, you know, studying and working at the same time. So we had, a, we had a big understanding of the process of all the projects, you know, so we had a, a lot of good background. So I think that's the other, other what was unique as well. We, we understood my, my dad's work, we understood this process. So it was actually easier for us to actually write it rather than, you know, get somebody else, um, because they wouldn't necessarily understand the full, you know, the, the something you could say the passion or the, the, the disappointment sometimes or of, of that process. So we would be able to capture everything, uh, you know, or, or as much as possibly could in this, this book of ours. That was Hanif Tayyab discussing his book titled Going According to Plan, The Architectural Journey of Aziz Tayyab.